Welcome to the webinar, everyone. Uh, my name is Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, and I'm pleased to welcome everyone to uh, uh, our webinar entitled Sick Kids Journey Towards Cultural Competence with uh, Karima Karmali. Uh, usually our, our webinars sort of fit into a, a theme. We have our patient safety webinars, which happen once a month. We have our, re, our uh, rehab and child development webinars, et cetera, et cetera. This one doesn't really fit into any one of those categories. Is this, uh, this concept of, of culturally competent healthcare uh, it really cuts across all of CAFC's programs. So this, while this doesn't fit into any one of our, our current programs, we're really pleased and excited to bring this, this exciting session to you. Uh, so um, I think without uh, any further ado, I think I'll be handing the presentation over to uh, Karima Karmali. Karima is the director of the Center for Innovation and Excellence in Child and Family Centered Care at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Uh, in this role, Karima provides strategic leadership to advance child and family centered care using innovative programs to meet complex needs of patients and families. Uh, and part of this uh, work is uh, is uh, that she recently led a large federally funded initiative that resulted in significant enhancements to the delivery of culturally competent care for the diverse patient population at SickKids. And I'm sure that diverse uh, population reflects the populations at our children's hospitals and many of our centers across the country. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to uh, just hand the uh, controls over to Karina and uh, we'll let her take it away. Great. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with you today to talk to you about the work that SickKids has done in advancing uh, culturally competent care over the last probably two to three years, and it's an area of focus for us uh, moving forward as well. The work that I will be speaking to uh, today uh, is really the work of very, very many people, both within the organization and outside of SickKids. Uh, and in fact, with me today, uh, I have three members of the New Immigrant Support Network here, um, and they are uh, Karen Sappleton, Sean Martin, and Stephanie G. Um, all three of them have been heavily involved uh, in this work, and so really, uh, as I said, uh, it's the work of the, uh, the entire team that I will be presenting today. Um, I also want to acknowledge the significant funding that we've received from uh, Citizenship and Immigration Canada. Um, and really, we would not have been able to accomplish all that we have done without their uh, generous support. Over the ne uh, course of the next hour or so, um, there, uh, I'm going to be really focusing on uh, three things. Uh, one is the Cultural Competence Education Project, um, the Translation Project, and then all of the initiatives around sustainability and uh, dissemination. Those are sort of the three distinct areas of focus for uh, the Cultural Competence Initiative here at SickKids. Um, and with that, I'll also be uh, talking about the results of each of the projects uh, as I uh, move along. Okay, so um, in the ways of uh, a quick background then, um, most of you probably know a little bit about SickKids, but SickKids is a tertiary and quaternary care um, uh, center providing a full spectrum of healthcare services across the continuum of care to infants, children, and youth up to the age of 18. We have about 8,000 healthcare professionals, scientists, and trainees uh, working here at SickKids. And key to the SickKids mission is championing an accessible, comprehensive, and sustainable child healthcare system that is family centered. So really the work that we've undertaken in the area of cultural competence is very well aligned to our mission and uh, strategic direction. This next slide really uh, talks to you uh, about the case that we made for uh, cultural competence. Um, there are really very many reasons why we chose to focus on uh, this particular topic. Um, as you know, um, Canada welcomes uh, many uh, new immigrants to the country on an annual basis and um, about 200,000 in fact a year. Uh, approximately 31% uh, of newcomers to Canada choose to settle in uh, Toronto. 
We have about 190 languages that are spoken in the greater Toronto area. Um, and this diversity is really reflected in the children and the families that we care for here um, at SickKids. As we know, many um, newcomers um, face many um, settlement-related stresses when they first arrive here. And navigating an unfamiliar health care system with an ill child really um, uh, compounds uh, these uh, stressors that they face. Um, and there is, you know, evidence that suggests that uh, the quality of care and patient safety can be compromised when healthcare providers don't respond appropriately to language and um, cultural barriers. Um, and in fact, there is research that indicates that Canada's newest settlers are subject to health disparities and inequities in healthcare. So and the question, of course, is that you know the demographics of our society have changed uh, over the last probably 20 years or so. Um, but the question is, have healthcare organizations um, kept pace uh, with these changes? And to address uh, these questions and these changes, um, SickKids decided to seek funding from a fairly non-traditional uh, source uh, of funding from Citizenship and Immigration Canada. Uh, and we were successful in securing, um, I would say, very significant funding um, to, in fact, uh, focus on this uh, work, which was to improve access to health care for, uh, for newcomers. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the key areas of focus have been uh, cultural competence education for healthcare staff, uh, the translation of patient and family education resources into a number of different changes. We've undertaken many different um, uh, initiatives uh, to, to sustain uh, a focus on cultural competence. And uh, we have um, looked at disseminating a lot of the work that we've done here uh, and sharing it uh, quite broadly across the healthcare system. Um, fundamental uh, to all of this work has been a very, very strong um, evaluation strategy. Um, and um, I'll be sharing some of the results of that, the evaluation that we've done of all of these projects with you today. So the operational definition that we've used for uh, cultural competence um, is on this next slide, which says that a culturally competent healthcare system has been defined as one that acknowledges and incorporates at all levels the importance of culture, assessment of cross-cultural relations, vigilance toward the dynamics that result from cultural differences, expansion of cultural knowledge, and adaptation of services to meet culturally unique needs. And this um, definition comes from Dr. Joseph Betancourt and his colleagues out of um, Harvard University. Um, and we've, um, you know, uh, a lot of the work that we've done here at SickKids has really uh, use some of the foundational work that Betancourt and his colleagues have done uh, at Harvard and um, uh, out of Boston. Um, we also used a uh, framework um, that Betancourt um, developed um, that, that really helped us to sort of look at the work that we needed to do uh, moving ahead. Um, his um, uh, practical framework for addressing health disparities um, defines different kinds of barriers in the in the healthcare system, and um, also um, suggests uh, various types of interventions to help uh, address these barriers. So the first type of um, barrier or area that he talks about is organizational uh, cultural competence. Um, and suggests that there are policies and procedures that are required at the organizational level that really look at the um, diversity of the patient population um, and, and suggest strongly that the leadership and the workforce of an organization also reflect the diversity of both the, the patient population and, and the general population in the, in the community. 
He also talks about structural barriers and, and the types of interventions that can be used to address structural barriers, including looking at the use of interpreter services um, and culturally and linguistically appropriate health education materials um, to, to help patients and families with uh, language uh, barriers. And finally, he talks about the barriers that sometimes exist between clinicians and patients and families through the processes of care delivery. Um, and he feels that these types of barriers can best be addressed through cross-cultural uh, training and education. And I, I would have to say that most of the work that we've done here at SickKids really focuses on this third component with some focus also on the, uh, on the structural uh, piece. So I want to move forward and talk to you about the first project, which is the Cultural Competence Education Project. Um, according to the Canadian Nurses Association, understanding and providing culturally competent care is now seen as a key strategy to reduce health disparities and enhance the health outcomes of many cultural groups. So with this premise, the uh, New American Support Network really decided to uh, spend a lot of its time developing uh, education to increase the capacity of staff to provide culturally competent care and services. Um, and in doing that, we really looked at what was important to staff here at SickKids uh, in some of the, the values, uh, particularly around family-centered care and patient safety. Um, and the education and the curriculum that we developed was framed within those key concepts um, to ensure that it was relevant to, to staff. We also provided education to non-clinical staff and this education was framed around uh, service excellent, uh, which is a really um, uh, a strong philosophy here um, at the hospital for, for sick children. So the next thing I'd like to do is just talk to you a little bit about the uh, clinical workshops that were um, developed. Um, and um, I'm going to focus uh, primarily on the clinical workshops instead of the, the other workshops. Uh, we went through various iterations of uh, workshops and landed on three half-day workshops for, for clinicians. And we used a variety of pedagogical uh, methods in delivering the, this curriculum. This included film, small group activities, role playing, and the use of standardized um, actors. So there are a number of learning objectives uh, for these three workshops. Um, they included really helping the uh, staff recognize the types and impacts of settlement stressors experienced by new immigrant uh, families. Um, and also how um, new immigrant families may disproportionately uh, be affected by health inequities and the social determinants of health. Uh, a large part of the curriculum really focuses on helping staff deepen their awareness of, awareness of personal biases and the impact that these types of biases and prejudices can have on uh, the quality of uh, health care but also on the relationship between the patient family and the health care provider. We looked at applying cross-cultural communication skills when working with interpreters and families uh, uh, with limited English proficiency um, and looked at a number of other practical tools um, such as cultural assessment tools in assessing patients and family um, needs. I'm going to move on now to um, the evaluation of the um, education uh, workshops. Over the course of about um, 18 months, we were able to deliver 173 workshops touching about 2,200 staff, uh, and 1,900 of these staff were clinicians, um, and uh, primarily uh, nursing staff just because um, nurses make up the, the biggest proportion of uh, clinical staff here at SickKids as in most, uh, most hospitals. One of the 
evaluation methodologies um, that we utilized is known as the commitment to change um, uh, exercise, which uh, is also a, uh, considered to be an educational um, intervention because um, evidence suggests that it, it promotes behavioral um, change. And essentially what this um, uh, exercise is about is that participants are asked after um, the third workshop to document three ways in which they're going to change, whether it's uh, practice change or some other kind of change. Um, and what we also did is we followed up with um, uh, a subset of these individuals, specifically 53 people, in follow-up interviews um, uh, following the, the workshops. The next uh, few slides are um, going to show you the types of commitments that were made um, by workshop participants. And this first, first slide shows you that there were about 2,200 commitments that were made by approximately 600 participants. Um, and, and the reason that it's 600 participants is because we, in fact, uh, started fairly late uh, with this exercise. Uh, and so we didn't capture the commitments of sort of the, the first uh, few workshops that uh, were delivered early in the, in the project. And what this slide gives you is a breakdown of the types of commitments that were um, made. So we, we looked at the commitments and we uh, looked at the themes, uh, and that's what the blue bars um, indicate. And the first blue bar um, talks about um, the uh, commitments that fall under the practice change bucket. And what you can see here is that 73% of all commitments related to practice change. The next few slides I'll show you actually breaks down practice change and talks about um, specific themes under practice change. So the first bar on this next slide um, demonstrates that 31% of commitments related to practice change had to do with improving communication with patients. Um, and the, the green sort of box um, gives you one of the commitments that one of the participants made. And I'll read that out to you. It says, uh, quote, practice asking questions, especially ones that I am uncomfortable with now, that will help me understand the importance of culture of my patients and families so that I can incorporate that into my care and make it more family-centered. The next bar um, shows that 27% of the practice change commitments related to doing culturally appropriate assessments. And that's because, partly because we did focus on uh, cultural assessment as part of the, the curriculum. And this particular um, commitment, uh, an example of one of the commitments, um, states that appreciate variations in affective response to pain, be sensitive to variations in communication styles, recognize that communication of pain may not be acceptable within certain cultures, appreciate the meaning of pain varies between um, cultures. Next bar um, shows that 27% of the practice change commitments related to making better use of available hospital resources. And this individual um, in the green box um, talks about, um, quote, to ensure adequate interpretation for families challenged by language barriers so that they feel well informed and comfortable with treatments and outcomes to be, be it in a hospital setting or care at home. So this individual really felt that you know they were going to try and make better use of interpreter services here at Sick Kids and outside. So now back to the main slide, which you know um, talks about the next set uh, of uh, commitments that were made. So we've talked about the 73% being about practice change. 
15% of the commitments related to belief or attitudinal um, change. An, an example of a commitment that was made here, um, a quote again, is that acknowledge that cultural differences exist and that I need to not make the assumption that my view or the hospital's view is what is best for the this particular for a particular family. End of quote. We also had commitments related to continuing education um, and advocacy. And in this particular quote, um, the individual uh, committed that they would play a more active role in acknowledging cultural competence and incompetence on the unit. So really about confronting colleagues or speaking to colleagues about uh, perhaps inappropriate behaviors um, that this individual um, perhaps sees on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm going to move on now to the 53 interviews that I talked about um, earlier. So 53 individuals who attended workshops and completed uh, the commitment to change exercise uh, were then followed up three months later uh, and were, were interviewed. Um, and what you can see here is that these 53 individuals may made 187 commitments about changing um, uh, their practice or beliefs. Um, and in the follow-up interview, 78% um, of the commitments that were made by these 53 individuals had already been acted upon. Um, and um, there was intention to move forward or to act on another 16% of those commitments. So Overall, there was, you know, there was a real uh, commitment to change, and people who participated in this exercise had, in fact, moved forward with uh, making changes to their practice uh, based on some of the things that they learned um, in the in the workshop. Another set of results that we want to share with you today are the um, the results related to change in practice with regard to um, interpreter utilization. So at SickKids we have two forms of um, interpreters or interpreter um, uh, service. One is over the phone interpretation available through an external vendor where essentially a clinician can pick up the phone and call the vendor and ask for uh, an interpreter for a particular language and that service is, is provided uh, immediately, usually. Um, and then the other is that we have uh, in-house medical interpreters for some of the top languages that are utilized here at SickKids. So this first graph that you have in front of you shows you how the volume of um, over-the-phone interpretation um, increased um, over uh, the time period that, that we started to deliver the education. So the workshops began um, in uh, 2009. Um, and at the end of 2009, and you can see that it's it was around that period that the volume of over the phone uh, uh, requests started to go up, um, and that incline has continued as, as we have uh, provided uh, telephones to all of the clinical areas, uh, so that they uh, to just to facilitate the use of uh, over the phone interpretation, um, and we've seen at least a doubling of the number of calls um, that are made uh, and a doubling of the number of minutes of over-the-phone utilization since we began uh, this work at the end of 2009. This next slide um, uh, is, is similar in that it shows you the increase in face-to-face uh, -face interpretation requests uh, following the workshops. and. Uh, really, we've seen about an 18% increase in face-to-face uh, -face interpretation over um, this time period. I'm going to stop here and see if there's any questions before I continue. 
Uh, well, that uh, there have not been any questions yet, but that does give me a, a chance to remind the audience to, uh, at any time you think of a question, just type it into that question box, and we'll build the list of uh, of questions as we go along. So, you know, again, just a reminder to uh, type in your questions as you think of them. Okay, great. So then I'll move on. Um, I'm going to just touch on the uh, translation project, which was also part of this initiative. It was a huge, huge initiative. Um, as many of you are aware, SickKids has a wealth of patient education resources through our About Kids Health um, department and website. Um, and the translation project focused on three key things. One was the translation of about 300 health-related patient education resources and other materials, including things such as uh, consent to treatment forms. And these documents were translated into five to nine uh, languages. We also created audio files uh, in these languages for, um, for all of these documents. Um, and we also translated the entire About Kids Health website into both French and Simplified Chinese. Uh, and if you've seen that website, you'll know and understand just how big a task uh, this was, but we have done that and it is complete. And if you go to that website, you'll be able to see that the content is available both in French uh, and Simplified Chinese and that the 300 patient education resources are available um, and can be downloaded through through that website. The languages that we um, translated the health related materials into include uh, French, uh, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, Arabic, Spanish, Tamil, Urdu, Portuguese and um, Punjabi and we did go through quite the process in identifying which materials to translate um, uh, before we went forward with that translation um, and this work I would say uh, took from you know the the very beginning of the project which started in 2009 uh, and was really completed um, in uh, early 2011, which is when the um, translated documents and the website first became available. So we are only now beginning to sort of conduct um, an evaluation uh, of this project, and um, so I don't really have a whole lot of um, evaluation results to share with you um, at this time. This, uh, this slide that uh, I've just put up actually shows you uh, part of the website um, in uh, Simplified Chinese. And I would, you know, we, we was really hoping to actually give you a bit of a demonstration, but we thought we couldn't rely on the internet connection to do that today. So um, if you're interested, then you can go directly to the website and um, check it out. Um, all of the translated materials are available there, and the hope really was that, um, you know, community physicians and other hospitals would be able to utilize these uh, resources um, as well. I'm going to now move on to uh, the next set of initiatives which really speaks to the sustainability uh, of um, this work uh, moving forward and the kinds of things that would help us uh, continue to focus on cultural competence in the organization. Karima? Um, the pictures, yes. We did have a couple yeah. of questions come in just after I uh, reminded everyone. We had a few questions if you wanted to take some now. Sure, why don't I do that? Sure. Uh, the first question uh, was from Lisa, and she's asking if uh, if your funding included the uh, the language line to support an incre that increased use that you demonstrated on the graph. Did the funding accommodate no, it, that increase? No, okay. No, it did not. So really the, the increase, we did some creative things with the over-the-phone interpretation. One was that we negotiated very, very hard with our... Um, with our vendor so that in fact at the end of the day um, our costs um, uh, per unit or per minute of utilization came down so substantially that even with the increase 
uh, in utilization, our overall costs um, remained uh, constant. So we were lucky there. Uh, but, you know, overall, there's been an increase in uh, costs for face-to-face uh, -face interpretation because that went up by about 20%. And that was not funded um, uh, through external channels. All right. Thank you. Uh, the second question was, uh, uh, Kiran, Kiran is asking, uh, how long after the training were the interviews conducted? Um, the... The follow-up interviews occurred three months after the training took place. So a participant would attend three workshops. At the end of the third workshop, they would complete the commitment to change exercise and document three ways in which they would change their practice. Um, they would go away and then three months later, um, there would be a follow-up interview uh, with, with that individual. Um, and uh, that's when we collected those results in terms of whether or not that pra their practice had changed. I hope that's what uh, uh, Kieran's asking. Um, I hope so too. <laughs> uh, another, okay. quest another question was, uh, how do you choose the topics for translation? I think that was referring to the About Kids Health website. Yeah, um, it, it was actually quite the, the complex uh, process and um, you know unfortunately just because of the constraints uh, in terms of time we this was supposed to be a three-year project that was in fact compressed into 18 months and because translation takes a very very long time uh, in because of the quality checks and so on that you have to do I, I won't get into the detail but uh, um, I you know just want to really point out that it is very very complex um, we you know, moved through the process of identifying uh, materials for translation fairly quickly. Uh, what we did is we went unit by unit, clinic by clinic, and asked them about um, the materials that they most fre frequently utilize and what they thought uh, they would benefit from in terms of uh, translated materials in the ways of patient education resources. So it really, you know, came from uh, staff uh, based on uh, the materials that they utilize most frequently. All right, thank you. Uh, okay. The next question is, uh, how was the accuracy of over-the-phone translation monitored? So, you know, that's not something that we do here at SickKids, but most vendors have processes and quality uh, monitoring uh, processes in place um, to ensure that the quality of uh, interpretation is accurate. Um, so it, it, it isn't something that we're doing, although, you know, going forward, that may be something that, that we look at. But Generally speaking, when you enter into relationships with external vendors, there is assurance that the interpreters that um, uh, they uh, hire are uh, trained um, and that they meet certain standards and have passed certain tests. But they also do have uh, quality monitoring processes on their end uh, to ensure us that, in fact, the quality of interpretation that we're receiving is um, of the highest standard. And maybe we'll just take uh, one more question here before we let you move on. Sure. This question might be a victim of uh, typing in quickly as you're trying to, uh, you know, cram a question into a small box. But so the grammar's not o not always, and the spelling's not always great. So I hope I am reading this right. I think they're asking, was there a a particular cultural competency survey that was used to measure the skills quanti quantitatively, or? That or is there one that you recommend to be used? And he's just asking if if there if it was mentioned, he may have missed it. Um, I, I'm not quite sure that I understand the question. I mean, we I don't think we did sort of an assessment of individuals around their cultural competence ability. And if there are such tools that exist, I think there are. Um, I do I don't recall us actually using one, so it's difficult for me to maybe answer this question. Okay. And if we didn't answer that question correctly, feel free to to, to clarify, and maybe we'll come back to it at the end. Uh, so that was the, that's the last of the questions I think we'll take for now. And again, just okay. to remind people, you know, if you think of more questions, again, just please just type them in as you think of them. So back over to you, Karima. Okay, thanks, Doug. 
Okay, so I'm going to move on then to um, sustainability and some of the initiatives uh, under uh, this really important area. But I just want to uh, point you to the pictures on this particular slide. What you see here are uh, pictures of a citizenship ceremony, uh, the first of its kind um, at SickKids, and we believe it may have been the first uh, such ceremony at a hospital in, in Ontario anyways. Um, and uh, essentially what happened here is that newcomers to Canada um, who were scheduled to become citizens at this time uh, came to Sick Kids, and our uh, president and CEO, Mary Jo Hoda, who has the Order of Canada, uh, actually was able to preside over the ceremony um, and uh, was able to deliver uh, the oath of uh, allegiance and um, help these uh, newcomers become citizens on that day. So it was a really, uh, I would say, a very special day and a very special uh, ceremony that uh, went uh, extremely well. Um, in terms of sustainability strategies, we've no used a number of different types of strategies to ensure the sustainability uh, of the work once the, the project actually came to an end. Um, and I won't speak to all of these uh, strategies, but I'll run through them very quickly because um, uh, they're all quite involved. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about our Champions program, which essentially ent entailed identifying about a hundred uh, clinical and non-clinical staff um, right across the organization at every level of the organization um, that wanted to champion this work. Um, and they would meet on a regular basis to talk about some of the strategies that they were using in their respective areas to promote uh, the uh, work around cultural competence um, and to also make it relevant and specific to their particular area of practice. Um, this was an extremely important uh, program that actually I think helped us a great deal in bringing about some of the change that we were looking for. Um, and, and some of these champions, not all, uh, continue to meet on a regular basis to, to talk about the work that they continue to do. We've also integrated uh, content related to cultural competence in our new higher orientation uh, programs. Uh, we've developed a, a, a specific strategy uh, for physicians because physicians were very difficult to capture in the um, three half-day workshops that uh, we were delivering. So we've come up with a very specific strategy to target uh, physicians. Um, and we've also developed um, an, uh, a, a cultural competence e-learning series, which is a series of about 15 e-learning modules that address uh, different topics related to cultural competence and clinical cultural competence more specifically. Um, and I'm really happy to say that these um, e-learning modules are available um, at our SickKids website, uh, but they will also be available through a link on the CAPC Knowledge uh, Exchange portal, I believe, um, after today. Um, we also delivered or developed um, the uh, uh, a film on uh, cultural competence uh, and I'm going to try and show you about a one minute segment uh, of this film just to give you an idea of what um, this um, film looks like. So I'm just going to go to that now. Don't cheat. I think uh, for me the English is uh, still the problem, like you can see, I'm here, it's over 10 years, but I'm still struggling the language. Pick your tongue. Can you touch your nose with your tongue? We moved from uh, China to Canada just uh, for uh, looking for the better future. Tell me which one is moving. It's a big challenge when we move, move from, the, from China. I was uh, doing the professional job, and my majority is a computer networking and a programmer. But uh, come to Canada, first uh, they don't recognize your 
your, the job you have done. We have to do the different jobs to survive here. Hair is, is it growing a bit? Increasing evidence points to significant health disparities among various racial and ethnic groups. These disparities are rooted in systemic inequities that influence the health outcomes for many newcomers. Both the Aryan and the Wang family stories illustrate some of the non-health related challenges researchers have attributed to the growing health disparity observed among immigrant populations. So this, this film is about a 20 minute film that um, follows a number of different uh, families uh, through the Sick Kids experience um, and these are newcomer families that talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges and stressors that they face as they navigate the, uh, the healthcare system. And again, this film is available on the Sick Kids website, and I believe will also be available on the uh, the CAPC or through a link on the uh, CAPC Knowledge Exchange, uh, as Doug just pointed out. We've also at the hospital um, purchased uh, 12 multilingual uh, wayfinding kiosks. Um, these are kiosks that provide uh, wayfinding information in uh, nine languages which includes um, English um, and a number of the other languages that I've mentioned um, earlier. Um, the kiosks also provide um, hospital services information in those languages um, and really the, the aim is to provide this information um, to sort of the diverse uh, patient population that we see here at SickKids. We're only now beginning to get results with regard to utilization, um, so I'm not going to speak about that today, but uh, we're hoping that uh, this, these kiosks become an important resource uh, for the patients and families that uh, we care for here at, at the hospital. This next slide talks to you about the patient and family satisfaction rates uh, related to the delivery of culturally sensitive uh, care. This is one of the indicators that we've been following and we think that the changes in this indicator have been due to sort of the education uh, that we've delivered but also the work done on the translation project and all of the sustainability initiatives. So what you see here is that um, until about 2008-2009, the satisfaction rate related to this specific question hovered around 70%. Um, and then when we delivered the workshops in late 2009 and early 2010, you can see that the satisfaction rate went up significantly, or it is statistically significant, by about five percentage points on the inpatient um, areas. Um, what we're starting to see now is that it's beginning to come down again, and we believe that this may be due to the fact that um, education has stopped in the last year. Um, and there hasn't been as much a focus uh, on, on this particular topic, so it points to the importance of, uh, I think, uh, ongoing education and it's something that we will be looking at um, as we move forward in terms of how we ensure that uh, people don't lose focus on uh, culturally competent care. So talking about patient and family satisfaction, uh, one of the other important sustainability initiatives that uh, we undertook related to the actual translation of uh, the patient satisfaction survey that uh, we utilize here at SickKids and I think most hospitals across the country use, which is the NRC Picker Patient Satisfaction Survey. Um, and what we've done with the survey is that we've translated it into a number of languages and what you see on this particular slide is what one particular question looks like in the languages that we chose to translate the uh, survey into and so those languages included Arabic, uh, simplified Chinese, Spanish, 
traditional Chinese, Urdu, and Tamil. And I want to just spend a few minutes talking to you about uh, this pilot and the results of these pi this pilot because I think um, it is uh, quite important. So as I mentioned, um, SickKids, like most other hospitals across North America, uses the uh, validated NRC picker uh, surveys, which is considered the industry standard in the assessment of patient satisfaction with their hospital experience and care. And generally what happens, of course, is that a random uh, sample of patients and families are surveyed using an English survey following an emergency department visit, a uh, day surgery visit, or an inpatient stay. Uh, now, there is limited research and evidence regarding the use of multilingual patient satisfaction surveys. It's, it's been done in some places, but um, in, in a very limited sort of way, although I know that uh, different parts of the country are now looking at it. Um, and so after discussions with NRC Picker, we decided to initiate a multilingual pilot um, to assess levels of satisfaction among patients and families with limited English proficiency, um, targeting uh, the, the languages that I pointed to um, earlier. So essentially the English survey um, was translated into those languages and the accompanying letter from uh, our CEO was also translated uh, into, into these languages. Um, and then patients and families who have had an emergency department visit uh, or inpatient admission between August and January um, that had stated a preference for communicating in one of the target languages uh, received a translated uh, version of the survey as well as an English um, copy of the survey. Um, and so we milled out about 924 uh, emergency department surveys and 94 uh, uh, inpatient surveys during that uh, time period. I'm going to move through the remaining slides quite quickly because of just time. Um, this next slide shows you the breakdown of the uh, surveys sent out in terms of uh, language. So you can see that the majority of surveys that went out were uh, in simplified and traditional Chinese. So that made it about 40% of the 924 surveys uh, that went out. Uh, the next largest group was Spanish, followed by, I, I think, Pomo. One of the things that surprised us is that the response rate to the multilingual surveys was pretty much the same as the response rate for the English surveys for both the emergency department and the inpatient um, uh, units. Uh, I'm not quite sure why, but we expected the response rates to be lower and uh, we were pleasantly surprised that in fact um, they were not. Um, so you can see that the eMERGE um, survey uh, response for the pilot was about 25% and for the English it's usually about 24%. Moving on, I'm going to just skip through the slide and go to the results of the uh, satisfaction results. Um, this graph uh, shows you the ratings for overall quality of care. Um, and what it shows you is that there is a statistical um, difference, uh, a statistically significant difference rather, between the uh, uh, results um, of the pilot and the standard uh, English survey. And what you see here is that in the emergency department, um, the rating for the quality of care in the language pilot was about 11% lower than uh, for the uh, English survey. Whereas for the inpatient area, there was no statistically significant difference. Um, the, the ratings were pretty much the, the same. This next slide breaks down the uh, specific dimensions of quality of care on the NRC Picker survey. Um, and you can see that the um, groupings that have a little red star uh, uh, beside them are the uh, groupings that uh, showed a significant difference. So, for example, information and education um, scored significantly lower in the emergency department by uh, about 11 percent. Uh, same thing with access and coordination and so on. 
So overall, the ratings uh, for the language pilot around quality of care were significantly lower in the emergency department than the results for the standard English survey. This particular graph actually pulls out one specific um, a question on the survey that asks about sen sensitivity to cultural needs and you can see that there is a very large difference uh, in the emergency room in particular with regard to the rating of the positive score for, for this question. Uh, it's 39% for the language pilot and 65.9% for uh, the uh, English survey. So there are probably many reasons for uh, the differences uh, noted in the uh, in the pilot. Uh, one, uh, so clearly there is a difference. First of all, um, and uh, it seems that communication appears to be a, a major factor uh, impacting satisfaction rating in the limited English proficiency group. Um, we think that. There are a number of reasons why um, uh, the, the scores are lower in the emergency room, one being that we only have over-the-phone interpretation available in the emergency department, whereas the inpatient units have face-to-face -face interpretation available. The other we think is that, um, that some of the inpatient units had already received the cultural competence education when we uh, conducted this pilot and this may have had some impact on uh, the uh, results as well. Clearly we feel that there is uh, a need to further investigate and explore how how culture plays a role in patient satisfaction surveys, uh, but that also we need from a health equity perspective to ensure that we continue to survey um, you know, diverse populations with regard to their measurement or their score uh, around patient satisfaction and, and the quality of care that uh, they received uh, in the hospital. Just a, on an a, interestingly, uh, as a follow-up, we did do um, intensive education for the emergency room staff around the use of over-the-phone interpretation, but also um, they attended the cultural competence uh, workshop, uh, workshops rather. And what we saw as a result of that is that an 18 percent increase in satisfaction to that question with regard to culturally sensitive care. So the point here is that uh, cultural competence education clearly, clearly makes a difference to the quality of care that's being provided uh, to this uh, population. Very quickly then, I'm going to move through the, the next few slides which speak about dissemination and really the key uh, area that uh, we want to focus on here is the uh, province-wide train the trainer workshops that we've been providing um, for uh, uh, healthcare organizations across Ontario. Um, this is a two-day session uh, for organizations that are interested in advancing culturally competent care and health equity in their organizations. And we have very expert uh, facilitators in Sean Martin and Karen Sappleton who provide specific guidance on implementing a cultural competence uh, program uh, for organizations. The uh, Train the Trainer workshops provide an overview of the curriculum for the workshops um, as well as uh, an overview of uh, program evaluation methods and in fact we provide these specific tools that we've used here at SickKids and share those tools through this workshop. Um, there is a very comprehensive Train the Trainer manual uh, that includes the workshop materials as well as a facilita facilitator guide. And by participating in the Train the Trainer workshops, the participants also have an opportunity then to join an online community of practice that we've established using LinkedIn. Um, and, you know, all of the resources that we've developed here uh, are available through a public website, through the SickKids website, uh, if you're interested in, um, in taking a look at them. So in terms of just results of these uh, workshops, we've to date delivered 16 sessions across Toronto and uh, across Ontario, and we've had uh, over 300 participants representing about 170 organizations across uh, Ontario. Um, and the 
feedback to the workshops has been overwhelmingly uh, positive and we are just beginning to sort of do a comprehensive evaluation to look at whether organizations are in fact able to utilize the materials we've provided and whether they're making any advances in their own organizations with regards to um, cultural competence programming and the initial results show that in fact that is taking place that these types of implementations are happening um, so we're very excited to see uh, where all of that leads uh, one of the things that we're doing right now is looking to see if we can um, uh, gain or secure some additional funding to provide this train the trainer program uh, nationally uh, because we're not able to do that right now so we're hopeful that funding comes through so that we can share uh, this work more broadly because I think healthcare organizations uh, across Canada are likely facing the same types of challenges um, uh, that organizations here face um, and so there'd be real value in sharing some of the resources and tools and the knowledge uh, that's been generated here. So just to recap then, um, cultural competence is uh, a really important strategy in the delivery of equitable health care to marginalized and disadvantaged uh, populations including newcomers. Um, there is evidence that shows that it improves safety, quality and uh, efficiency. Um, immigration trends highlight the need for uh, culturally competent care and, and the integration of cultural competence uh, across the Canadian healthcare system. Um, and finally, an effective cultural competence strategy should include initiatives that target the leadership, education, policy, and practice as we've been able to do here at SickKids. In terms of next steps, um, as I've mentioned, uh, you know the resources are available uh, on our website, and we will continue to disseminate uh, broadly. Um, we're hoping to develop a national train the trainer program, and one of the really exciting things we're uh, doing is partnering with other organizations uh, across Canada to develop uh, national health equity standards for uh, for hospitals. So in the end, I just want to leave you with um, this quote from His Highness the Aga Khan, which I think speaks to the importance uh, of this work and why we need to continue to be vigilant around it. Um, he says, what is required goes beyond mere tolerance or sympathy or sensitivity, emotions which can often be willed into existence by a generous soul. True cultural sensitivity is something far more rigorous and even more intellectual than that. It implies a readiness to study and to learn across cultural barriers, an ability to see others as they see themselves. Thank you very much, and I'm open to taking questions now. All right. Well, thank you for that. It was a fantastic presentation. Uh, and I think uh, we do have a number of other questions. We did start a little bit late, so we're going to try and take as many questions as, as we can if people are able to uh, hang in with us. Um, so the first question that we have, that this came in shortly after uh, you started into the sustainability section, um, the question came in was, uh, did you also translate info sheets to Aboriginal and Inuit languages? If so, was it in, under the same, you know, part of this project, under the same budget, under a different budget? And if you didn't, was there a reason that you didn't uh, interpret into those languages? Right. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so we did not as part of this particular project only because the focus uh, of the funding uh, given that it's through Citizenship and Immigration Canada was uh, specifically on newcomer populations and so we worked with CIC to look at what the immigration trends look like and uh, what the key languages for translation should be. So those were not languages that were included, although my understanding is that we've received some additional funding through the Public Health Agency of Canada and that is something that we are exploring now. Uh, and Doreen has asked uh, that the citizenship ceremony that you had the pictures of, uh, was that, yeah. when was that held at SickKids? That was held, I think it was in March 2011, just as sort of the major project 
uh, was coming to a close. We actually held a, an entire week of events uh, related to cultural competence and we called it a cultural competence week and part, part of that was actually hosting a citizenship ceremony here at Sick Kids. so that's when that took place. Um, Lisa has asked us, uh, can you give a brief description of how you reached the doctors? And she put in a second question to sort of clarify, meaning in terms of, uh, of the education component. Right. So, you know, one of the, the things we discovered very quickly, um, and, and we, you know, not, not a surprise really, and that is that uh, for physicians to get away for half-day workshops was going to be extremely difficult, although there were many clinics that were willing to close for a period of time so that they could send their physicians. Um, but we didn't think that it was a good idea to um, sort of solve one access problem by creating another kind of access problem. So we decided not to go down that path. Um, and instead we looked at um, other strategies to try and reach the physician group. So of course the e-learning modules are one of the things that we're using as part of our broader strategy. Um, but the other really is um, targeting spe specific specialties and uh, divisions uh, and delivering presentations to uh, them individually. So just as an example, we worked with the physician group in the emergency department uh, and delivered an education session there that was tailored very much to meet the needs of that group in the emergency room context. Um, and of course we, we build in some of the core principles of the uh, broader training that's been delivered, but then it's also tailored to meet the individual needs of physicians. So it's not, uh, you know, 12 hours of training. Uh, but it's, you know, I think it was one and a half to two hours of very intensive and focused and tailored uh, education. Um, so that's sort of the strategy that we're using with the physician group. Um, and we will continue to use the e-learning modules to really uh, push that forward as well. All right, thank you. And Lisa's also said uh, congratulations on your success, excellent work and a very helpful presentation. Uh, for other centers today. So thank and thanks for sharing, she said. So thank you uh, to Lisa. Uh, we also have a question here that says, how do you evaluate the impact of dissemination of educational resources? So um, as, as I just mentioned, um, you know, that is a strategy that we're just beginning to develop now. Um, we're in fact conducting follow-up interviews with the organizations that participated in the train the trainer workshops. So that's going to be sort of a key component of our evaluation to see first of all whether the participants found the uh, workshops helpful uh, and second you know the degree to which they've been able to take uh, the resources that we have shared with them and uh, how much they've used those resources but also how they've um, made advances uh, around cultural competence programming in their own organization. So we're conducting interviews with uh, participants um, to, to look at the impact that the um, train the trainer workshops in particular have had. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to do that with um, sort of looking at uh, the specific utilization of e-learning modules, although we are looking at the possibility of uh, measuring the number of hits those um, e-learning modules get on our website, but I'm not sure whether that is something that um, we've uh, made able to make much progress on. All right. Uh, this next question, uh, she's asking, is your train, uh, is your well, she says it's the national train the trainer program. I'm not sure if it was or not. I guess that's a good thing to ask. She's asking, is it open to people outside of sick kids? I think you mentioned it's across Ontario, but I'm also wondering if it, if you've delivered that workshop outside of Ontario at all. No. So um, as I mentioned, the the workshop what we're doing with the work the train the trainer workshops is we're offering them here in Toronto, but also geographically across Ontario. So we have been able to get some funding to do that, and we've delivered I think uh, workshops in about fourteen. Uh, 12 to 14 cities across Ontario. We've done a total of about 16 sessions so far. Um, 
our, our hope is to take this nationally given the impact it has had and the success uh, it's had. But of course funding is the question now and it is something that we're looking at right now but if anybody has some ideas uh, we'd you know, be really open to, to hearing them. All right. Um, she's also mentioning, she's asking if, uh, if you're familiar with the CAPC program, the CPNP program, and the AHS program of the Public Health Agency. I'm not familiar with what those acronyms mean, but... Uh, no, but, I... All right. It doesn't sound familiar to me. All right. <laughs> she would maybe need to spell them out, and then I might have an idea. Yeah, all right. if, if the person asking that question wants to spell those, each of those out, maybe we'll come back to that question. But We've just got a couple more questions, and maybe we'll just cut it off after, after that, uh, just in the interest of time. Um, we have a question here that says, have you considered as one of your strategies working to implement this valuable training into the into health professional education, like it, into the curriculum, for example, in, in university programs? Yes, um, we have actually considered this. And, um, you know, during sort of the, the initial phases of the uh, project, as I said earlier, it was a three-year project that was compressed into 18 months. It was one of the things we really wanted to pursue but just simply did not have time to do. Um, and it is something that we're just beginning to have some conversation on now to start having individual discussions with various health discipline schools uh, at the universities. Um, and, and there is interest. It's just now a matter of us actually taking it forward uh, and having some very serious discussions around it. We're also looking at whether there's an opportunity um, to work with the professional sort of regulatory bodies and prof professional associations governing uh, the practice of the various health disciplines to see if there's an opportunity to also integrate uh, cultural competence into the standards of practice for uh, those disciplines. Uh, and we have um, had, I think, some success with the uh, Canadian uh, Society of Respiratory Therapy. Um, Sean, in fact, uh, just recently presented to the group and is working with them to look at how we might be able to integrate this curriculum into um, their approach to, to into their national approach to education. And our hope is to continue to do that. And uh, again, it's just a matter of sort of um, setting priorities and, and hopefully getting some ongoing funding so that we can uh, pursue some of these goals. All right, and I think uh, oh we've got a we've we have the uh, those acronyms spelled out. It's the Canadian Prenatal Nutrition Program, the Aboriginal Head Start Program, and the Communicate Action Program for Children. Uh, and she's suggesting that many immigrants attend these programs, and she thought there might be a, an opportunity to link uh, link the, these programs with your program, just to provide that that cultural competence to these programs that are accessed by uh, many immigrant families. Well, we would certainly love to do that, and maybe what I'll do is get that information from you, Doug, after the webinar is over. Sure, and, and these are all programs of the Public Health Agency of Canada. So, uh, okay, so great. We'll, uh, all right, and the last question I think that we're going to take here is uh, is from Sharon, and she's asking, did you conduct interviews with patients and their families to identify key cultural competence issues that needed uh, to be addressed, other than the access accessibility slash language issue? Uh, were, and were your training programs based on this? That's a really good question. I'm so glad that it was asked. I was hoping it would come up. Um, I think that if there was one a sort of flaw of the work that we've done, it's been exactly that, but it's not because we didn't think about it. Uh, it was more because of the, again, the timelines for the work that needed to get done uh, because of delays in the project and the funding coming through. The timelines were compressed um, and, and um, the work needed to do, get done in a very short period of time. So um, it, it was very difficult to, to actually do that piece. Having said that, one of the things that uh, we did do is um, concurrently we ran uh, a case management pilot where we actually um, helped uh, newcomer families navigate the healthcare system. These were families that were referred to us um, through the various departments at SickKids. And in working with those families, we were able to really identify some of the key types of issues that they face 
in navigating the system and, and in accessing healthcare. And we were able to use some of those, um, uh, the issues identified through that project to in fact uh, inform the curriculum as it was being developed, but also as it was being tweaked. It was, uh, I have to tell you, a, a, a process that, of continuous improvement. So we would deliver a workshop and then you know, there were times when we would sit down and, and tweak those workshops to improve them because, again, because of the short period of time and we wanted to make sure that that we improved that process as we went along. So the information that came to us through the case management pilot, through the families that we served in that pilot did in fact inform that work, but uh, unfortunately we did not conduct independent focus groups uh, with families prior to beginning this work. All right. Well, thank you for that. And I think that's going to wrap up the uh, presentation here. We did get a comment back from uh, Rita, who is at Public Health Agency. She's given me her contact and information. I'll pass that along to you, Karima. And, Great. Uh, and we'll get you guys connected. Um, and uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, all of this was recorded on the and, and will be posted within about a week or so. It usually takes me to get uh, the recording up onto the Knowledge Exchange Network. We will have a link to the e-learning modules that Karima mentioned and any other resources that we mentioned here, including uh, Karima's contact information and that sort of thing. And in the meantime, if you uh, would like me to co connect you with Karima, I could be happy to uh, connect people if they just send me an email and my email address is up on the screen there. So uh, with that being said, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Karima and to uh, Karen and the rest of the team there for helping organize this webinar and for giving this great presentation. And uh, you know, as I mentioned at the top, this is a, an issue that does cut across all of CAFC's programs. All of our members are interested in this type of content. So, uh, uh, And uh, we just had a question come up about the PowerPoint presentation. I believe we'll also be po posting the PowerPoint presentation on the Knowledge Exchange Network as well. So again, thank you, uh, Karima. And if there's any final words before we sign off, I'll, uh, I'll leave it up to you to have the last word. No, that's great. Thank you so much for your um, interest today. And uh, I hope that you'll take a look at some of the resources that we're going to post for you. All right. Well, thank you very much again, and we'll hopefully see everyone on our next uh, webinar.